saints of God, holy and dearly loved, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The basis for our meditation today comes from the first epistle of John, the fourth chapter, starting at the 13th verse. What do you fear? The dark? Dentists? Sharks? Foreigners? Oftentimes, our fears are irrational. The darkness can't hurt you. Dentists take care of your teeth, even if you are afraid of the drill. Normally, humans are not a natural prey for sharks. And in fact, many more humans kill sharks than there are sharks that bite humans. And as for foreigners, most of them don't want to harm you. They want to live in peace and have a better quality of life for themselves and for their family. And yet oftentimes, we don't fear the real dangers, what can really harm us. A person can drive every day without worrying about getting in a car accident. But that same person can refuse to fly, even though, statistically speaking, flying is far safer. Another person might fear a terrorist attack, but isn't concerned by the fact that they smoke two packs of cigarette a day. Luther explains that we should fear and love God. Why should we fear God? Jesus says, I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body and after that have nothing more that they can do to you. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him who, after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. The ju judgment, the righteousness, the punishment of God are things that we can properly fear. And yet, we don't fear God and show him the respect that he deserves. Why? Because we become so accustomed to our sin and comfortable with it. In the same way that we are comfortable with driving, and in the same way that a smoker stops paying attention to the health warming, warnings on his package of cigarettes, we become comfortable in our sin and desensitized to its consequences. For that, we need to repent. Luther says that we should fear and love God. Why love God? Because he loves us. Even though he has the power to cast us into hell, Jesus goes on to say, are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And not one of them is forgotten before God. Why, even the hairs of your head are numbered. Fear not, you are of more value than many sparrows. What are you worth to God? The Father sent his only begotten Son to die for you. He paid the ultimate price to redeem you. To him belong all the animals of the forest, the cattle on a thousand hills, all that moves in the fields. The world is his and all that is within it. And yet his promise to you is this, call upon me in the day of trouble, I will deliver you and you will honor me. He has delivered you, not with perishable things like the cows of the field or the birds of the, the air, but he has redeemed you with the precious blood of his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, predestined before the foundation of the world and raised from the dead so that your faith and your hope would abide in God. God is not your enemy. And if you reject his love, all that remains is his judgment. All that it remains is that he will be your enemy. Not because he's against you, but because you are against him. The Apostle John writes that perfect love casts out fear. The starting point isn't that we need to love God more. The starting point is that God loves us. He, he knows everything we love because he first loved us. Who among us hasn't run? 
Who hasn't denied what he's done? Who hasn't hidden his sin? All of us have done that. And our inclination is to hide and to run away because we don't want to face the punishment for what we've done. We don't want to be judged and condemned for our actions. But the perfect love of Jesus Christ, the fact that he died on the cross to forgive you your sins, casts out that fear. For example, knowing that your parents and your grandparents love you, you can go to them and tell them what you've done and ask for their help. Knowing how much your spouse loves you, think of what you can confide and entrust to them. Knowing how your children love you, can you not go to them and ask for forgiveness? How much more then, the God who loves you and sent his son to die for you, how much more does that love cast out your fear of going to God? We can confess our sins to him and ask for his help. The will of God is not to condemn you and send you to hell. If that's the case, he would never have sent his son to die for you. John writes, by this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment. How many Christians live every day worrying about the day of judgment, asking Am I worthy of eternal life? Will I be condemned despite my very best efforts? The more we look at ourselves and our sinfulness, the more we recognize that we deserve God's judgment. But the grace of God is that he gives us what we don't deserve. The Lord directs our attention to his love for us. His love doesn't limit itself to his laws about how we treat our neighbors. God's love is made manifest in Jesus Christ, who took on human flesh to save us. In becoming man, Jesus didn't show love to an ideal person, but to real sinners. He didn't love a perfect world, but a, a world that is rebellious and sinful. When you're confessing to God, you're not telling him anything that he doesn't already know. You confess your sin because you need his forgiveness and because he promises to forgive you, to cast out your fear of your sin and its consequences. Your assurance in the face of your sin is that Jesus has come to seek and to save the lost, the hopeless, the weak, and the despised of this world. Jesus has come to save you and to call you to himself. John says that love is made perfect in us. He doesn't say that we love perfectly, but the God of love comes and dwells in us. And as his children, he abides in us and we in him. John writes, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. The Spirit has abided with you since your baptism when you received him as a gift of God. Your hope and your assurance come from the fact that the Father sent his Son to be the Savior of the world, to be your Savior. John was himself an eyewitness to this salvation. So he writes, We have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. So how do you know this is for you? How do you know God loves you? Even if you don't feel the love of God, your feelings are not always right. How many times have you felt alone when you're surrounded by people who, who love you dearly? God's love is greater than our feelings. The proof of his love is seen that he became flesh, that he has suffered and died to redeem you. And the promise that his sin atoned for your sin is, made pro is proven by his resurrection from the dead on the third day on Easter Sunday. John writes, Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, 
and he in God. So we have come to know and believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. Now, we must be clear. Your confession of faith is not like saying magic words that automatically save you. There could be somebody who comes into church and and confesses the Apostles' Creed but doesn't believe it. Is that person saved? No. John makes that clear when he says, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. We love God because he first loved us, but that love of God for us propels us to love our brothers. Our confession of faith comes from the fact that we have a living, vibrant faith that is informed by the word of God and the preaching of Jesus Christ as the Savior of the world. John deals with our need to confess our faith because of false teachers who were claiming that Jesus is not the Son of God. We also, in our day, have to deal with false teachers. How many other religions are ready to recognize Jesus as a prophet, an enlightened master, a miracle worker? But believing in Jesus for those things doesn't save. Jesus and Jesus alone, who is the Son of God, who has died to redeem the sins of the world, he is the God of love who has come to earth in real history who continues to dwell with us so that we can dwell with him. If we fear God above all things, there is nothing else to fear. And the perfect love of God casts out all other fears. God is not against you. He is for you. Let's think about the situation of an old German pastor and hymn writer. Paul Gerhard. He wrote a hymn called Ist Gott für mich? Is God for me? Gerhard lived during the Thirty Years' War. Three of his children had already died. Because of conflicts between Lutherans and Reformed, Elector, Elector Frederick Wilhelm forced all the pastors to sign a document, a document of compromise. Despite being sick at the time, Gerhardt refused to sign and encouraged all of the other pastors that were Lutheran to remain faithful. Because he stood firm, he lost his position at his church. Shortly thereafter, his wife and one of his sons died, leaving him a widower with a six-year-old son. And yet, despite that, he wrote, If God himself be for me, I may a host defy. For when I pray before me, my foes confounded fly. If Christ, my head and master, befriend me from above, what foe or what disaster can drive me from his love? I build on this foundation that Jesus and his blood alone are my salvation, my true eternal good. Without him, all that pleases is valueless on earth. The gifts I have from Jesus alone have priceless worth. Dear saints, have no fear. God loves you, and the perfect love of God in Christ Jesus casts out all fear because he has taken your punishment to give you life eternal, to forgive you of all of your sins. In the name of Jesus, amen.